Hello, I just wanted to take time out of uh, this episode to follow up with the fan, Emma Benner. She has been listening to the podcast and has listened to many of the episodes, and I sincerely appreciate that. And she's been nominated for Best Buddies Champion of the Year. She's helping raise funds uh, through donations and silent auction items for the Best Buddies program. And what Best Buddies is, is they're a nonprofit that is dedicated to establishing opportunities for one-to-one friendship, integrated employment, leadership development, and inclusive living for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I will make sure that everything is in the show notes. So if anyone out there is interested in donating, it would be incredible. Sincerely appreciate Emma reaching out. Really want to help. I want to use this podcast as a platform for change and to help people and to share these incredible stories. And obviously, Emma is one of those people now. So thank you so much, Emma, for reaching out. Please, everybody, again, all the links for Instagram for the donation for the website will be in the show notes. So please, please check that out if you're inclined and on to the rest of the episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Our Athletes. My name is Michael Raziel and I'm the host of the show where I get to have conversations with Olympic athletes, hopefuls, and legends on their story and path to the games. Today we have Ned Lomagora. Ned um, is from the Bosnian team. He made the Olympics in 1994, but a huge reason I wanted to have Ned on was because his story is absolutely incredible. Um, I don't want to go too deep into it now. I know this is a little bit of a longer interview, but I promise you it's one of the most interesting stories. Um, His country was in civil unrest. Um, There was a a war going on between all the factions of Yugoslavia. Uh, He gets into it much better than I will here, but just what he had to do to represent his country and the opportunity he had to represent his country four years or two years earlier um, and giving it up because he didn't like the way the politically uh, the, the the turmoil that was going on he wasn't about that so it was very very interesting to hear him speak about it and getting the full story of him trying to literally escape his own country in the cover of night to make sure that he can represent his country in the Olympics is just absolutely incredible in my opinion so very excited so please Without further ado, here is Ned Lomogora. All right, today, special guest, Ned Lomogora Luge from the 1994 Olympics, born August 27th, 1971, and what was Yugoslavia at the time. He started Luge at the age of 12 and started traveling to World Cups and World Championships around the age of 15 and 16. He attended the 1994 Winter Olympics in Lillehammer, Norway, as part of the Bosnian national team. He graduated from Illinois State or Illinois Institute of Technology and has an MS from MIT and is the current owner of Cape Ann Development. Ned, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I appreciate it. Hey, Michael. Thank you for having me. The pleasure is all mine. You're the Olympian. You're the one with the incredible story. I'm just the guy asking the question, so I really do appreciate it, Ned. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the the biggest reason um, – You reached out to me, which I'm very grateful for. And the biggest reason I wanted to have you on the podcast, um, you know, obviously I tend to stick to more uh, USA team, Team USA based athletes. But again, your story is just incredible. Some of the things you're doing, obviously we're starting to develop a relationship um, speaking as often as we do, just turns out that way. But um, I really love your story. I think it's really incredible. And I want to make sure we can get that in front of more people. My goal is to help impact others through Olympic athletes. And you're one of them. So um, you are the third, if I'm not mistaken, third non-Team USA member. So I really do appreciate you being on that short, incredible list. But um, Ned, I mean, yeah, let's let's jump right into it. You So you were born in what was Yugoslavia. Uh, I am not a geography buff or really a history buff. So I can't tell you what that country is now or what it's become. But um, if you want, take us take us all the way from the beginning and tell us what it was like growing up in, in uh, you know, a, a part of the world that I'm not and I'm sure many of the listeners are not super, super familiar with. Sure, Michael. Uh, so <clears throat> Yugoslavia is once a large country with 22 million people and had six uh, republics and two kind of like smaller uh, states uh, bunched together. And um, Tito was a president, a lifelong president, uh, admired, you know, and also 
um, he he was kind of neutral in politics. So our country was based on like a social uh, socialism system that was um, kind of open to businesses as well. And we had free border where we can leave and come back, unlike some of the Eastern Bloc. So we didn't belong to Eastern Bloc. We didn't belong to Western Bloc. We were pretty much independent, but our economy and our commerce heavily dependent on exports as well as imports from um, Western countries. We also had good export with and import with the East. So we kind of were in the middle and doing well uh, growing. Uh, my childhood was pretty um, happy. Um, I d did a lot of sports. I went to um, some, our school system is very rigorous. So I, um, I noticed that when I came to this country, when I went to colleges like MIT and I realized that I, you know, have a, you know, I, I know, and I can do a lot of things that were considered very difficult, um, came kind of easy to me. So I finished college and master's degree in four years. I, um, you know, was also uh, able to, co uh, I was tutoring other people, physics, math, uh, etc. Uh, but I, as I was growing up, you know, I had a normal childhood, went to school, went to, you know, started doing luge. That was not then it was not uh, uh, normal or uh, uh, usual, but started doing luge at 12, as you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, but I also played basketball. I played volleyball. I played handball. I swam. Um, so I did a lot of different sports as well. Um, and uh, loved watching basketball, loved watching. When I came to this country, I loved watching Bulls back in the, at the time when uh, Michael Jordan was still mm -hmm. playing. Uh, I was glued to the screen and um you know that that was really a big deal here um and i still consider him the greatest player that ever played the game um, and then after that i kind of stopped watching so much but i'm still doing a lot of things uh, you know like i'm actively exercising and kind of connected with athletes um from my own country but also in athletes that i met over time because i was traveling internationally and through you know that that kind of over years, I met the different people in different countries and uh, kind of stayed in touch with them. Um, so that's kind of like a, my my childhood. You know, it was just school and 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 uh, you know sports. What Luge did for me is basically let me um, travel internationally and it expanded my horizons. And mm -hmm. you know, a fifteen year old kid going to Austria or Germany or Italy or you know different countries and just being exposed to that was was such a great uh, lesson and such, such a great education that I could not get otherwise. And um, I, I, that's how I started learning languages. So my English, I'd never really studied it. I just kind of picked it up as I was traveling and watching movies, listening to music, because our music and movies were all pretty much American music and movies. We were very open to the West. Uh, we, we wore jeans and Nike and, you know, like we were very mm -hmm. pro-America. We loved sports. The NBA was very popular, you know, et, et cetera. So Hollywood, you know, that kind of uh, environment. Um, and, you know, taught me, you know, and then I started speaking German when I was spending some time in Germany. Uh, same with Italy. I spent some time in Italy, started speaking Italian. So it really gave me the opportunity to learn the cultures, learn the languages, travel around uh, at such a young age. And, um, and later when I was preparing for Olympics, I also got to travel intensely, um, you know, over the course of a, about a year mm -hmm. um, and compete and um, yeah, stay in different countries at the time. I love it. Then I went, yeah, so that's kind of like my pre-Olympic experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here, actually, I, I know you I have a couple of story how, we'll, how that ha happened. <laughs> we'll get to, I promise that story is incredible. So I'm very excited to um, get get to hear it again or, or for a, in, a, in a different medium. But I do have a couple mm -hmm. questions about growing up. Like, obviously, again, you know, growing up where you did um, kind of almost in the middle of, as you said, the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc and being able to kind of free flow ish in a in a sense that's uh you know came from a very lucky place i mean if you were born a couple miles east a couple miles west everything would have definitely been a little different so i think it's incredible right. but um Good. with yeah, with yeah. luge that's no keep going no i think you you really understood that very well the position we were in that if you if i was born you know, a one hour time difference, uh, east or west, I, I couldn't be traveling because being in Yugoslavia meant that you can actually travel to places mm -hmm. that Western people from Western Bloc couldn't travel or people from Eastern Bloc couldn't travel. So we could travel either way. Mm -hmm. And we had actually people, a lot of people come to our country for vacations, for example. You know, Croatia is very popular even now, but back then it was it's such a beautiful country with 
beautiful coastal line. And, uh, and then we had a lot of people that, you know, for example, Czech Republic or uh, Poland or Hungary or Romania, um, because once they were in the Eastern Bloc, they only had a vacation, I think, once every two years or so. And it was just like, they, or, or permission to leave the country once mm-hmm. every two years for like five days. And what they would do, they would come to our to Croatia, and um, they were very poor at the time. They were like, you know, you know the situation before the wall has, uh, fell, and um, they would come to our country. They were so happy, you know, there was something of a, of a you know, vacation for them that of a lifetime. So um, I met a lot of them there too. Um, so as I was growing up, I've seen, you know, like probably a couple dozen different cultures just in my own country, let alone the fact that I was traveling outside. And, you know, we had Germans and English and, uh, you know, like uh, Belgium like, coming to our coast. And then we had Romanians, Bulgarians, uh, Czechs and Pol- Poles come to our country. So we had like this little United Nations on the coast of Croatia every year, right? Where I vacationed every year for a couple of months. And, you know, it was, it was, it was an incredible experience. Yeah, that is, I mean, it's just, it's very, you know, you've brought it up multiple times now and we've only been talking for a few minutes, like the expanded seeing other cultures and being able to be in, in front of other people and learn what they do in their experiences clearly has had a huge impact on your life. Not only just the people coming to your country, but the, the places that you were able to get to, as you said, Germany, Romania, Austria, Italy, and the list goes on. Um, so I guess one question about, you know, obviously that, with that being so important, Luge was really the conduit, if I may to get you to many of those places. And so I, I'll be honest, I never heard or saw or thought of the sport of luge until I started watching the Olympics. You know, I never thought of, Hey, let me get on this piece of equipment and go really, really fast down this ice track. Um, so being that you started at the age of 12, were you just in a very, well, I, I don't believe in luck, but were you just in a very good place that you just happened to be somewhere where there are luge, a loose track was or is loose very popular in your, your home country or, you know, what was or is, or however we like to talk about it. Um, is, is it just a really popular mm-hmm. sport there or were you just blessed to be put in a spot very close to a track where your parents were like, yeah, let's go try this out. Well, it, it is a confluence of factors, but if I, to be honest, I think when I look back, it's happenstance that I was able to be in Sarajevo at the time when the Olympics were going um, we, you know, built the track just around the time I started training and it was for the Olympics in 1984 and Sarajevo was center of the world at the time and they built the track. It was the fastest in the world at the time, most modern. Um, and I got to be in Sarajevo. I got to know my best friend, got to, his mother knew the, the coach, the luge coach uh, of the new luge federation that was just formed. So the, just because I knew him, and he started doing luge. He basically told me, and obviously we had to do it together because we did everything together. You know, he, he was gone for a few weekends and, and we were like, dude, we're not hanging, hanging out anymore. What's going on? I was like, oh, my mom is making me do this sport. And I'm like, what sport? So I was like, you should come with me and watch me. So I went there a few weeks um, after he started. And, um, you know, I talked to the coach. I said, you know, I'd like to watch my friend and, you know, he, and, he was like, okay, so just stand by the, by the track and watch him. And after, you know, at, at the end of the training, coach said, hey, you know, I was an athletic kid. You know, I played different sports. I was already kind of tall, um, 6'2 now. But, you know, I was, you know, he, he saw me as an athletic kid. It was very curious. And he thought, you know, hey, why not try? Like, you know, you're here, you're standing here all day watching your friend. Why don't you try? And he set me from a you know bottom of the track i mean it's like track is really long and you can't go from the top unless you're like really well trained and after after a while so he set me down and he let me do like a trial run you know just for fun and so once i finished that run he watched me the entire time and uh and at the end of the run i remember him saying like you have to come tomorrow and just start training this sport so basically, he just picked me. Says like, you should be training this. You should be training luge, and you should you should be on the team. So he picked me. I started, and it was great. My friend was there. I, you know, we traveled together. Like I said earlier, and that was happenstance. Like knowing him, him know, being connected to the coach, 
the fact that Syria had Olympics that within like one year before, the, uh, one year after that, we were just already building track was built one year before Olympics. That's when we started training. You know, that was that was something that you know probably wouldn't have happened in other circumstances. So I'm very glad. Um, the only thing I can say is that I was curious. I was athletic, and um, maybe if the chance was elsewhere, maybe I would have still gotten into it. But it was to me a new sport I'd never seen before, never heard of before. And every one of my friends had no clue what it was when I tried to explain them. <laughs> I can only imagine. until they saw it what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, I, it's just incredible. Your friends, your friend's mom was friends with the luge coach. And it just cool. so happened that at that time, the stadium was built so that you could train. And like just so many different yeah, things. Track. Yeah, yeah track. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. There, there are so many things that yeah, had to track. go right yeah, yeah. to get you there, uh, to get you here. Um, to get you to the Olympics and it all happened and the stars aligned. So I'm not, I don't believe in coincidence. Um, so I think that that's incredible and everything just lined up perfectly the way it was supposed to and got you to exactly where you got to be. So I think that that is just absolutely incredible. So you trained in luge, you, you, so at the age of 12, by the age of 15, you were already competing in world cups, um, and world championships, correct? I mean, so you're, you're traveling Mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. At the age of 15, I mean, I'm yes. 27 now, and I've been to Europe once, and I've been to nowhere yeah. else. Uh, <laughs> so I've been to a couple islands down in, you know, the, the, the Caribbean down there. But, um, I mean, what is that like at such a young age, especially back then? Um, you know, what is this, the, the 80s, the, mm-hmm. the beginning, the, the end of the 80s, middle of the end of the 80s? Oh, yeah, this was like, not, not uh, even, was it? Middle, yeah, beginning so of the 80s. Was, no, it was mid the 80s. Mid 80s. And, and it was... Um, yeah, so it was a really great time in our country where our economy was at the peak, actually. This was right before, um, you know, at, by the end of the 80s, we started having internal uh, conflicts that led into uh, war later in the early 90s. But, you know, right in the middle of the 80s is when, the, I, you know, towards the end of the 80s, I was actually starting to travel, uh, which was considered a, like the, the golden age, you know, of, of our former Yugoslavia. Which is funny, it's like it kind of like stock market it always peaks before it crashes, uh, you know, and it's like this exuberance that, you know, people think it will never happen, but that's exactly kind of thing that happening in Yugoslavia. We were so happy, the economy was doing well, and then a few years later, you know, I had, you know, MIGs and, and tanks in my city, right? So that was, that was a huge awakening, and you, it tells you how things can change quickly. But yeah, so we were traveling. How it was, it, how it was is that I was so excited. You know, my, my first trip, I was so excited. I couldn't like, you know, sleep that night before the trip and, you know, never been out. And, you know, to be, you know, even, you know, we were open country, but, you know, it's not like common for a kid of, you know, age of 15 to travel, um, to, to start traveling. And by the age of 20, I already seen half of Europe, you know, so mm-hmm. I, it was really exciting. I was, I couldn't sleep. I remember my first trip. And um, I think we went to Austria and seeing a different culture, a different world there. And, um, you know, I, I fell in love with everything. And we, we got also a little time to see places, you know, like we went to Graz, we went to Innsbruck, we went to um, Leipzig. We went to different places, just kind of like get acquainted with culture, things that we read, you know, birthplace of Mozart or, you know, places that had a significance to to um, the culture uh, we, we we took some time uh to actually see and visit um and it was incredible you know talking like meeting new people um and they a lot of people were international too you know obviously it's international sports so i met first time i met american team for example that was my first trip i met american team and we cl- clicked really quickly we just had this cultural uh commonalities that really made us click much faster for example if, which is funny because we are europeans right but i remember having much more much closer connection immediately with american team than say german team or other teams in europe so which was really interesting um and we became friends and you know um and later through throughout my you know sports history uh, you know we hang out with them and they also came to sarajevo years later after the olympics they continued to train our track u.s team wasn't that great for a very very long time 
but then over years over you know that they started to get better and better and they used our track because it was the fastest track because their reasoning was if you, if you can make it in Sarajevo you can make it anywhere right you can kind of like it's so fast it's so demanding it's so technical that they they use the track to 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 learn and to study loose sport and again u.s loose team was way behind germans way behind austrians way behind italians and even now you know those three countries italy germany and austria are top top countries but the distance in terms of the mm-hmm. quality right now um qualitative distance between them and loose team from us is so much smaller I'd say the several orders of magnitude than it was in, you know, mid eighties, early nineties, mid nineties. Now they're like over time, U S team has just advanced so much and they're starting to win medals. Even in the Olympics, I think it was one, you know, last, if you look at the last few Olympics, there was at least probably one. I mean, I think it was the last Olympic that U S um, won, 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 uh, one, one, one medal, I think it was a bronze, um, but still even dominating countries are Germany, you know, I, I was actually, I happened to train with uh, Georg Huckel, which is the most um, prominent, most celebrated Luge uh, athlete of all time. He's a German guy. I, we mm-hmm. happened just to be invited by German team after we left Sarajevo to, to prepare for the Olympics because it was war and we didn't have anywhere else to train. So they invited us, they hosted us in Berchtesgaden in Germany beautiful place um and we trained there with their olympian olympic team so I, every day in the gym and on the track i would be talking to Gary Huckle and he would give me tips and pointers we would spot each other on bench press or whatever right we were eating lunch together at the cafeteria just kind of you know I, he was he was like you know he won four gold medals and two silver medals in six olympics is amazing guy um so you know, so you get to meet people like that, other famous people. I don't want to like list them all, but you know, because of sport, so uh, you know, it connects you to other people. You get to meet celebrities and you know, athletes, politicians, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I think it's just such an incredible, and as you know, as you said, you know, being so young when all this was happening, and now you know, getting these opportunities is just is so so cool, and obviously has shaped a significant portion of your, I mean, pretty much your entire life at this point. I mean, what is, what do you remember from the age of seven and before? Like, so pretty much most of your life has been spent in the sport meeting and and doing incredible things, traveling around the world and having a a huge hand in it. So I think that that's just absolutely incredible. Um, And then as you kind of started to allude to a little bit, war did start to creep in um, to your country a little bit. So can you start to tell us about, I guess, that time period where you're still competing you're still racing you're still going to places around the country but the olympics are coming up and and you know what what were some of the thoughts that were going through your head and obviously you as you already said you were brought to other places to train but what um what was that time like in your country and understanding like hey there's these two things going on one i'm trying to become one of the best athletes in the world the other is you know we're becoming slightly war-torn over here well, let me start with the story uh, where um, basically in 92, 92 is a time when we, uh, Bosnia was, was they pro, our country Bosnia proclaimed independence, uh, in the, you know, um, independency from um, uh, Yugoslavia at the time. Uh, if, if you remember from history, what happens is in uh, late 91, um, the Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia started to fall apart. Slovenia was the first country that, took off and um, Yugoslavian army at the time, which was 90 plus percent, you know, Serbian army really. What in reality it was just really Serbia controlling the entire army, which we realized, but you know, it took a world for a little bit of while to figure that out. Hmm. Slovenia took off, they be- became independent. They didn't want to pay taxes to Belgrade anymore. Um, Belgrade was kind of like center of all uh, Yugoslavia. It was in Serbia and, um, you know, Slovenia said, hey, we want to be independent. They had a referendum, overwhelmingly 99% of whatever. Um, you know, we want to be independent country. And then Serbia started to try to try to resist their independence. And within seven days, Slovenians were prepared. They were armed. And they strategically, they already knew what to do kind of ahead of the like, They did it very well. 
So the conflict only lasted with the Yugoslavian army, conflict only lasted uh, seven or so days, like a week, I'd say. Within a week, you know, Slovenian troops just kicked them out, kicked all the Yugoslavian troops out of Slovenia and closed their borders to them. And then as they were pulling back, if you look at the, geog you know, the, the chart of Yugoslavia, you have Slovenia on the you know, east, uh, I mean, uh, west, north, northwest. Then if, as you go down towards, towards east, you have Croatia and then Bosnia and then Serbia. So the next in line was Croatia. So Croatia got, um, you know, they, they started, Serbian army started to do the same things in Croatia, started, they were starting to incite conflicts and started to kind of like, you know, arm the, the army there. Because we have army, like locations all over the country. Um, and, um, you know, we had a big army too, over a million on standby soldiers for a country of 22. So that was a, was, and we were armed to the two. We were like a third conventional army in Europe. Um, I mean, if you remember Stalin, if you know the history, Stalin couldn't even attack Yugoslavia back in late 40s. This was right after the Second World War when he took all the other countries except Yugoslavia, threatening Yugoslavia, it will send troops in. And Tito said, okay, fine, we'll, we, we're waiting for you, right? So this is how strong Yugoslavia was, that not even Stalin there to attack it. That's how we maintain our independence. So we had so much army and so many guns that you can only imagine when that, those guns are turned to, to, onto their own people, right? The, the carnage and the, the mm -hmm. devastation that happens. So that's what really happened. So Serbian army wanting to keep the dominance and wanting to keep Yugoslavia intact, wanted to um, now force Croatia to um, not, you know, they wanted to keep Croatia or at least parts of Croatia that were, you know, they thought would belong to Serbia because there were a lot of Serbian uh, population in those mm -hmm. areas. Croatia, of course, did the same thing that Slovenia did, which is referendum, said, no, we want to be independent, goodbye. And that's when the real world, a real war started between Croatia and, and Serbia. And as that was starting, Bosnia was still kind of in the center of everything, you know, between Croatia and Serbia. And but there was no war at the time, but we were starting to see what's going on. And Bosnia did the same thing. And then things started in Bosnia. So, so you could kind of predict what, mm -hmm. would, what would happen slowly, but it was so slow, it's kind of like that people couldn't even believe that a war can, can, can start in our country, and it did, right? And then also media was controlled by Serbian um, army and, and, and Belgrade, right? This, the Communist Party there, and they were feeding you know, media new, news, right? We mm -hmm. only had like three channels, right? Not like here. And we didn't have any independent channels. It was all state-run. So the news we were getting is that, you know, there was a conflict, there were rebels attacking the sovereignty of Yugoslavia, and they were, you know, aggressive and all that. But in reality, it was Yugoslavian army trying to, you know, take over parts mm -hmm. of Croatia and attacking, attacking you know, Croatian people uh, that was really going on. We were getting the grapevine, right, uh, you know, through other channels, through people that lived there. That was completely opposite of what we were getting through national TV, national state-owned TV. And uh, we knew something was going on. So, so the story, my story is like in February 92, because of the conflict in Slovenia and, and start of conflict in Croatia, Yugoslavia had uh, sent a team to the Olympics. They wanted to send me to um, uh, uh, Alberta, uh, I mean, I mean uh, in, in uh, France, right? Um, there, was a, there was the Olympic Games in France in 92. Um, and... And I, um, in Alberville, and I um, didn't want to go because I was seeing what's going on and I didn't want to be representing Yugoslavia at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Alberville is the only, I was pretty much mature enough to go to the games, even though I was very young. But, you know, being top, top in, 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 in our country, I was supposed to go and there was, there was the opportunity, but I didn't want to. And uh, because of this reason, right? I didn't want to represent Yugoslavia. So that was in February 92, and in April that same year, war started in Bosnia. So, <laughs> you know, I was kind of, I had, mm -hmm. had a premonition of what would happen. Uh, so the, the Olympics that I competed was in um, 94, which is, you know, first Olympics of Bosnia, where Bosnia was an independent country. And uh, prior to that, I was in 
middle of the war for like 10 months. So um, I was there, I experienced it in Sarajevo. I was in the, in the under siege uh, with, you know, hundreds of thousands of other people and uh, ex- firsthand experience of how, it, what it feels like to be surrounded food shortages, uh, you know, everything, shortage of everything, no, no, you know, no power, no, no uh, water. Like, you know, there's like a lot of things that were happening uh, while at the same time being constantly bombarded, constantly attacked, uh, sniper fires, etc. cetera. Uh, seeing, you know, seeing, seeing devastation, seeing death around me. Uh, so that was, that was really, really, um, I mean, obviously experience that I never expected I would, I would have. And um, it motivated me even more when I got a news from, um, it came really from the government of Bosnia. It came from the top, came from the, you know, you know, vice president and president. They wanted, they would, um, you know, obviously during the war, you can't just leave the country because, you know, you're supposed to defend the you know, country and mm-hmm. every young and capable person from a certain age would be, Drafted. I was drafted. I was in an um, um, area where I was uh, working to protect the executive branch, kind of like a White House equivalent of ours where all the politicians were. Um, and I was in that, sp- it was a, kind of like a National Guard, um, not like here, but it was active duty National Guard. It was protecting presidents and it, kind of like personal detail or protective detail for these uh, high level politicians. So I got into that unit that was formed especially be- during the war and got, uh, you know, some, some training in um, you know, military training during that period of time. And um, then, you know, I got news that they want to create a team. They want to send people out. Um, and as long as a catch was, as long as you can leave the city, you know, they'll let us go. They'll sign off that we can go. We're not deserting or anything like that. And they will support us. Once we get outside, there will be some support for us to train and continue to prepare. But the catch was to leave the, the, leave the city, which was surrounded by Serbian forces, right? Leave the city alive, right? I mean, that was the catch. So you, have to, you have to get out of the city and stay alive. <laughs> so that's, that, that was really um, the most frightening part of my war experience, actually, just getting out. Of, of so, the city. So the, your government pretty much said, yeah, we will support you, but you have to just be alive on the other side of enemy lines, essentially. Um, so, wow. That is, and so, I mean, I'm assuming there had to be some sort of internal debate whether it was worth it or not, right? Like you had the opportunity to go to the games in 92. Uh, um, but as you said, you didn't want to yeah. represent Yugoslavia because you understood what was really happening at the time. And as you said, then three or four months later is when everything started to break out. Um, so you had the opportunity to go mm-hmm. with no conflict, no potential danger or death. Um, then this was the time when they decided to turn the winter and summer games rather than have them on the same year. They had exactly. then the winter games two years later. So you were lucky you could then get this two opportunity years again two years later. But this time it's a little bit different mm-hmm. because you are now having, uh, you know, you're, you're allowed to go. You'll, you get all the support. But the catch, as you said, is you just have to be alive, which <laughs> – 99% of the time, I'm assuming most of these athletes expect that they will be alive. But in this case, it was, uh, I'm not going to say it was 50, 50 cause you're here now, but it was, uh, it was definitely a little bit more up in the air. So, I mean, what, right. what was the internal debate? Like, did you speak with your family, your friends, just like, what was that like saying, Hey, I have the opportunity to go to the games. Now this is your second opportunity to go to the games mm-hmm. technically, but you're now representing right. Right. what you believe in as your country. Um, I mean, what did they say? What, like, what was what were those conversations like? Right, and you know, it's funny. I joke about it. like they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, was it such a I mean raw offer, right? And, yeah, it made me. It's almost like uh, then I was like, oh, oh man, I should have really gone to Alberville Olympics '92. You know, <laughs> now yeah. that I realize, but but no, I still wouldn't have gone um, obviously. And I did talk to my family. I did talk to my coach and other athletes and some athletes didn't leave because they were just, you know, scared of death. Yeah. Obviously what could happen. Their families were against it. Um, I made a decision. I talked to my family. I said, I will go. Um, and they supported me. I mean, they were really scared and, um, but they, they, they were, 
they kind of felt confident that I could make it and that I'll do it. Uh, so um, I also had to have a plan. So I did talk to my coach and we talked to some people on what's the best way to do this. And um, the best way to actually get out of the city at the time was through the um, airport. Airport was uh, the only um, part of this um, siege, right? Um, only, only area where Serbian forces were not allowed. The entire city was surrounded by them, except for the airport, right? That airport was a neutral zone that was set up by UN. The, the way they did it is they said, look, we need to bring humanitarian aid like food and, and, and medication and all that and take severely wounded people or s people that just need it or even officials if they needed to because Bosnia was still acting as an independent country so they would sometimes fly out the president to you know basically go outside and represent the country right so there were these humanitarian flights where you know both parties had to like obey and it was run by UN um, but that was a really small patch you know, compared to the city, the size of the city. So you, so that was, the way you do it is you basically cross the airport, you know, and hope that you don't get shot by snipers, right? Because Serbians knew people were trying to get out because that was the only neutral area they couldn't control, but they could control, you know, for distance, you know? So they had, um, you know, infrared equipment, they, they had, you know, thermal imaging, I mean, again, like we had guns that, tons of it, right? I mean, that was just fully equipped army with everything. Um, and yeah, the the, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but the point you made earlier about how the Yugoslavian army at the time was just packed to the gills to the point where Stalin didn't even want to attack loaded. it. And as you then said, now you're kind of now turning all those guns inside. And now, you know, something that yes. was a point of pride, something that was a point of pride, um, you know, earlier is now, um, you know, a, a terrifying realization that that then might be bound to you. That is, that is just absolutely intense, Ned. I'm, I'm sorry, please keep going. Wow. It, it, is, it is intense. And, you know, so that's, uh, that was frightening. And, you know, Serbian army actually, in terms of uh, manpower, they had like one one third of what Bosnians had. You know, in terms of manpower alone, but they had like like hundred times more guns, right? So they had guns. They they had so many guns they didn't even have enough people to operate. That's how many guns they had. Like they had tanks, they had cannons, they had like the RPGs. Like you know, they had. Every soldier was armed to the tooth, and every soldier could drive a tank if they wanted to. That's how many, that's how much, you know, they had. And, and they have Air Force, right? So actually, good thing is at some point, the UN had a no-fly zone over Sarajevo. So that helped because in the beginning of the war, I, I had MIGs um, or MIGs, the Russian made, because we, we bought those from Russians, right? Yugoslavian army bought those from Russians. I mean, those are, those are so devastating. I mean, they were flying over low, low you know, low altitude fly, fly over Sarajevo and they would drop these, you know, like grenades, the, like the rockets, the, like, and it was just like two of them could, could you know, like within 10 minutes, they would de could de devastate it. the whole like um, block of the city, right? Like literally obliterated. I mean, that's how powerful they were. So thank God they stopped them. You know, like UN said, no fly. This is no fly zone. You can't do it, you know, because they were killing so many innocent people. So anyway, um, yeah, so the guns were a problem. They turned in, in, internally to, you know, hurt us. And all those guns were now surrounding the airport, right? So <laughs> we figured a plan that, you know, other people have done it. And some, you know, we knew the probability of getting shot there was pretty high because we knew people got shot there trying to leave. Some people left for medical emergency. Some people left because their child didn't have milk and they trying to get it to the other side to get, you know, like a gallon of milk for their baby, right? Or something like that. So there were, you know, all kinds of reasons why people were trying to get, go out or cross that area, which was super dangerous. And to make make things worse, what UN did is they didn't even guard it themselves. They figured it was too dangerous for our own soldiers, right? This is their job. But they figured, hey, you know, this is too dangerous. We can get killed there. So we're going we're gonna to pay someone. So they paid uh, French Foreign Legion 
mercenaries to actually be at the airport. These are trained professional soldiers, right? That, um, you know, I mean, the reality is they're not obeying the same rules of engagement, right? And they're mm-hmm. not, they're not like a regular troops in a war, right? That if they're paid, they're going to do their job. But, you know, if they feel like once in a while, they might shoot someone just because, right? Or they can engage in sort of torture or, you know, like conduct that is not something a soldier from a regular, say, NATO army, right, would ever do, right? Because it's just not a code of conduct there. But French Foreign Legion, that's a different story. So that was another story. We had to kind of avoid them while we were trying to get out of it, but they were patrolling the airport. And Serbians knew, so Serbians didn't attack them or trying to shoot them because these guys brought their own guns and they were, they were able to shoot back and also they were able to summon if they wanted to, um, you know, somebody from NATO to like send, you know, some F-16s, you know, to, to cover for them or somebody um, or Mirage or somebody, you know, on the French side, if, if they felt they were threatened, they could call air support. And so Serbians didn't really mess with them. So they were able to patrol the airport. But if they caught somebody, they could, A, you know, they didn't shoot many people. I, I haven't heard that kind of thing happening, but I heard people being, um, you know, thrown like, like they take Bosnian people and throw them on the Serbian side, right? Which is almost like death warrant. Or they 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 would catch somebody if they are angry enough, they would beat them up and send them back. They would hold them in custody and torture. I mean, there are all kinds of things that they could have done to us. So that was a risk. So we had to kind of like do two things, avoid them, hide from them while trying to cross all along. Like Serbians were like, you know, watching the airport the entire time. <laughs> So that was the rest, but I, you know, I figured people, some people had made, made it, and if there was, a, there was a plan in place, we talked to people who made it, how they made it, what's the best time to do it, time of the night, um, all these things, what's the best ra- route through the airport, because, you know, you, there's certain areas where there's like some ditches and uh, ter- terrain was uneven, there was some elevation and some, some places where you can actually hide. So... We had a plan, we had a strategy, and the best thing we could do is like hope that we could adjust and, and on the spot if something goes wrong and you know pivot. Uh, and so the, obviously the outcome was positive. Uh, we made it. I was I came out with a team of three, three of us actually. Luge team was just one one woman, one me, one man, and our coach. There's three of us in our team that crossed that night from our team. And there are other teams that crossed at other times. So we did this in early February, February 7th, actually, I remember. And it um, took us about three hours to crawl out for something that would take you 20 minutes, not even 20 minutes to just like, it took three hours to go get across. <laughs> wow. And I mean, but like, what's, what's the then runway for lack of a better term, especially when talking about an airport, like just because you got out of the airport and across the enemy lines, I mean, I'm assuming there's still danger, right? Like there's still some sort of danger. So how long did it finally take you until you felt safe, I guess, again? Oh yeah. Yeah. So so the good thing is that once you get across the airport, you're immediately in the Bosnian territory. There was mm-hmm. a patch of land that was, that was still under Bosnian control, Bosnian army control. Uh, Bosnian army started to really grow right from the beginning of the war. It wasn't really organized at the time, so it was semi-organized. So there were fractions there that kind of like um, had authority over certain parts of Bosnia. So that was one danger where... You know, they were a mix of, sometimes they were criminals that organized themselves and, and they basically used, you know, took advantage of the situation to charge people with fees to like cross over the territory um, or sell them the items of food for exorbitant prices. So you never knew, like, you know, where you, who you're going to encounter on your, on your voyage, right? So on the other side, we knew there was an army outpost that uh, accepted people that would come out of the city, right? The, 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 those that they made it they would accept, they would, you know, kind of like help them get them water and, and help them if they got wounded or something like that. And then after that, depending on where you want to go, um, most of the territory was sort of uncharted, right? And um, you had to go through multiple 
checkpoints we we kind of knew ahead of time where it wasn't all Bosnian army right it was Croatian army because remember there was Croatia already started war before us so as they started war there were a lot of Croatians in Bosnia and they affiliated with Croatian army and so they didn't have fights with Bosnian army they were kind of like collaborating with us but at the same time they also wanted their own sovereignty so during the war these things and lines are blurred so you don't really know like what their intentions are. So you have to be careful and tread carefully, right? So you go to their territory, trying to get out of Bosnia, trying to get out of Croatia. Eventually our, our goal was to go to Germany, but we had to go to Zagreb, which was the capital of Croatia, which was completely under Croatian army and was free, free, right? There was no fighting over there. But in order to do that, we went through territories that were no man's land in a way, right? They're like patrolled by these militias, right? People that had no military training, like, you know, semi-criminals, even criminals, right? Gangs. So it was a wild west, right? right? So there were several checkpoints. One of them was a little bit more, uh, one of them was kind of nerve wracking. We were on a bus. We got stopped in the middle of <laughs> nowhere. They had us all checked, but what was helpful, it was a Croatian um, militia, militia at the time. It wasn't even Bosnian. And they, they were not very nice to most people, but, but they didn't har harm anybody. They, I think they took some money, or, uh, but uh, they didn't harm anybody. It was just like very, very tense situation. And what helped us, I think, is that we had, our president gave us personal signatures, like the release form. Because uh, a lot of times, you know, look at the, you know, they look at me, I'm like a young guy, you know, athletic, you know, fully capable, right? Why am I like leaving away? Why am I leaving the, you know, the country? Why am I leaving conflict when, you know, I was supposed to be in the army, right? They would think I'm deserting. So that was part of the problem. So sometimes our own army would question why you're leaving, right? So president gave us release forms where he said, you know, these are members of the you know Olympic team that we formed. They are, you know, I give them full immunity and pardon from military dues. Well, I mean, in, in short, right? So basically anybody who's reading, there's a signature, there's a stamp, there's like, you know, like president signature, there's other military, like a general top military. So that would help, you know, like having that, obviously we would not be able to do it. Having a brand new passport that our government produced for us, um, that helped with Bosnian passport, right? The first Bosnian passports, you know, um, and um, so we, made it we made it without uh being held held back without any uh incidents um there were tense situations but nobody everyone seemed to kind of like risk like stay away from like they didn't were like trying to engage with us right they kind of left us alone i think once we show these uh papers to them um no, nobody messed with us basically and we were able to gradually get into the zone where there was no fighting was like you know and then take a tr train once we got out we were in the back of a truck literally going across the mountain at like minus 20. i mean i remember freezing to death i mean it was like so cold so we went over the mountain for the tr for like hours we were driving a on the bed of an open truck we crossed that then we would take a bus through through mountains and then we at the end took a train all the way to zagreb so it was like a multiple stages of our trip it took a while, like at normal times, it would take you a few hours to get there. It took us like a few days just because it was just so, so dangerous. And, and so, um, it, uh, and you know, unknown, like there was so many unknowns. We didn't even know, like we had to p ask people which way to go, right? Like, you know, because some roads were closed. So what were the alternative roads? Where the, you know, is there a bus we can take? Is there like somebody who was doing, so some people are doing it on their own. You pay them money, they'll drive you, right? But then who, you don't know who's driving you. It could be a criminal, right? Who will take your money and dump you somewhere, right? So we had to like find out, do like intelligence gathering before we even proceeded. So that slowed us down tremendously. We took days to, to get to Zagreb. Once we got to Zagreb, it was great. We stayed there for a week just to recover because mentally and physically, was, yeah. we were exhausted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, I mean, and that's a whole story. We, we, and then also we needed... To get visas to to leave um, Croatia because Croatia was a country now had different diplomatic um, 
uh, relations with the rest of the world, and we also needed to get Bosnian visa because the Bosnian consulate within, was in Croatia now. So we had to do it all through proper channels, right, to get into Europe because now Europe had different relationship with Bosnia and then it had with Yugoslavia. So we had different, you know, every, everything had to be, be proper. So we needed visa to get out to go to Germany, etc. So, yeah, yeah, that is something that that is just absolutely incredible. And thankfully, as you said, you made it out. I mean, it sounds like the worst part was that truck drive um, in minus 20 degree weather. That might have been just the absolute worst, um, considering how deep that it was into the the, the adventure, let's call it. Um, and then, I, you know, I assume once you got to your destination, you were able to contact your family and your friends and let them know and everybody was happy. Then did you did you call up the president of Bosnia as well? Did you kind of just let all the proper channels know like, hey, we're here, we're good. We could really use that support that you promised us now. <laughs> um, so we we didn't have to call. Uh, we were already connecting with the uh, person who ran the Olympic Committee for Bosnia in Croatia. So they already accepted us there. They hosted us, uh, um, and we were spending a week or so there to acclimate to get papers. So he that the you know um, top top official from Olympic Committee Bosnia Olympic Committee took care of everything and uh, was fully informing the president. So they were in touch. Um, I personally didn't like go back and call the president like that, but uh, he did. And he confirmed the, our um, details for our trip to Germany. So um, once that was confirmed, it was the second week of our stay in, in Croatia. We again took a train uh, to Germany, went through Slovenia um, and um, I think Austria. And then we ended up in, in, Garden. It was a place where we spent some time uh, recuperating, uh, training. So it, it, again, this was the winter time, end of the season, actual season. So we didn't do so much luge that, you know, we just try to acclimate coming from war, you know, like, you know, I was, uh, you know, there for, for what, 10 months. So, you know, you lose weight when you're eating same meals every day and nutrition was very poor. So it took me a while just kind of gain some, you know, weight and then start to, I wasn't even able to train right away because, you know, we were all so weak. We mm -hmm. just needed, needed food, needed rest, needed just basic things, right? So light exercise and all that. But, uh, but it's amazing, you know, what uh, support can do. So German team was amazing. Um, their Olympic team, like I said, you know, I was training in the same place and with same, um, in the same gym and same, facilities with the uh, best luge, luge athlete of all times, Gerhard Kockel, who was, you know, like four Olympic gold medals, two of silver. And I saw a guy every day and, you know, he would take me up on the Alps and we would jog, you know, quite twice a week. He would take me, he, we, he would drive me up really high at high altitude. It was just jog and chat. And, um, you know, and I regained my strength over, over time. It didn't take that long. Um, and by, May, I mean, so we got there probably in the February, and by May, I already I was like lifting almost as much as this guy, and you know, like they were amazed. So our coach really drove us hard, which was which was amazing. We ate so much good food, and it's amazing what you can do with you focus on just you know resting, eating, exercising, working out, and training hard. So within several months, you know, basically we all transformed. I went from like probably put 20 pounds of muscle just there, just training and working out. Um, we went to Italy. Um, we went to Croatia after that. We went back to Germany starting the season and we traveled and then competed in the World Cup. And then we went to Olympics after that. So I'm just kind of short concatenating all these, all these countries. Uh, but, you know, every country that hosted us gave us really good conditions. Um, and help us, you know, train, gave us facilities, amazing facilities, every country, you know, uh, from Germany, Austria, Croatia, Italy, every, everywhere we went. Um, and then we traveled around, like, so every two weeks we would travel to a different country, compete in different World Cup. We went to Lillehammer actually in December, or it was November, I think it was November, even before the Olympics to kind of test the track. So I was in Norway two times once in November of 90, um, 93, and then I was there 
94 mm -hmm. February. So yeah, I, I tested, it. tested it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's just incredible. Um, you know, thank, thank you to all the people that had a hand in, in helping you and, and your coach. And as you said, the other, uh, the female luge member, um, of the Bosnian team. I mean, I just think it's such a cool story, Ned. I mean, it's cool cause it worked out. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great story. Yes. And again, really, <laughs> really appreciate you sharing it. I mean, then actually going to the Olympics. I mean, you were one of the best athletes in the world at something. And as you said, you had the opportunity to go in 92, did not want to represent the Yugoslavian, um, country at the time because we kind of you kind of saw what was going on um you then have this incredible opportunity to it, escape your country essentially escape the war torn country that you were in to um you know then be able to compete again i mean what did that when you finally got to go to the olympics and you finally were able to fulfill that dream what was it like for you your coach and and your teammate but what was it also like for the country knowing that not only did you guys get out, but then you had the opportunity to represent this brand new country that just became real just a year and change earlier. Um, what did it mean to the country as a whole uh, to see you there competing at the games? I mean, it meant the world to me. And I'll just kind of give you a few examples of like my parents and my sister were still there in a war, in war torn Sarajevo, right? While I was in, you know, traveling around and competing, right? So it was a, psychologically, it was in, it was such a pressure, you know, like you, you have to be at your best emotionally, you have to be prepared. Luge is a very uh, mental sport. I mean, it's very physically demanding because you're at high speeds, you're hitting um, very high accelerations. Your body's uh, being, um, is, is, is um, undergoing, you know, three, four Gs in every turn. Um, so it's, you, if you take beating by the time you finish running, you feel like you were box, in a boxing match. I mean, it's, it's very exhausting, especially at the beginning, you have a start ramp where you pedal and, and push yourself off. And it's a, it's like, um, let's say parallel to a sprint, you know, a sprint for like nine seconds. This is literally you, you're sprinting, but you're not even using your legs. You're using all the upper body to push sled and propel yourself on ice, punching, you know, with your spikes that are on your hands onto the ice it's 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 as hard as rock and you're propelling yourself down a ramp 45 degree angle so you're going from zero to like 60 within like four seconds like literally like a really fast you know sports car um and you don't stop accelerating until you get to the bottom right i mean you continuously start accelerating so then you have to be mentally prepared and so having parents back in the mausoleum thinking the background in my you know back of my mind is always war right what they're doing how they're doing that was a that was a huge challenge for me for other athletes right to just be able to prepare mentally for every run to to train every day um so that was the biggest challenge i mean physically i you know i physically i, I can't say you know that I had any issues I, as a matter of fact when we were training in germany they tested us in I had a third fastest start compared to all the German athletes. And that was something that was in, in, incredibly important in Luge. Um, start is not only technique, but it's also physical preparedness. So for a guy who just came out of war, you know, not even a, like six months ago, they tested us at the beginning of the season, the Olympic season, right? So it was like probably October. They had a ramp and they just have a ramp just for starting, right? And so they measure acceleration and speed and time, start time. And they just couldn't believe it. Like, just couldn't believe, like, how, like, how did you, how do you do that? Like, how can you be this, this fast? Like, you, you never heard of you. You're like this kid and you just come here and you come as a skeleton, you know, in six months, you're like third fastest starter of our own old team. And these guys are pros, right? So our coach really did a number on us in terms of like making sure that we train hard that we did well, that we um, focused on that. So physically, there wasn't an issue, but mentally, we got into a position where, you know, every every race, you're thinking of your family after race, before race. So that was really hard to overcome. And uh, there was the biggest, biggest obstacle to athletes um, from our team. Uh, knowing that my parents would be watching Olympics, you know, like there was huge expectations. And also, you know, I couldn't communicate with them like all the time. It was really hard because we didn't have like cell phone, like you couldn't call them on Zoom and Skype. 
there was no technology at the time. It was a cell, cell, uh, satellite phones, right? And only satellite phones were only used in emergencies. So basically, you, you have to write letters, kind of like you, you, you set back like 100 years where you know, people were writing each other letters to, to stay, you know, to communicate. I couldn't just put, pick up a phone and call because they didn't have, phones were not working. Once in a while, they would work because at some point they started to kind of um, let people have electricity and then phone service re um, returned. Um, and um, yeah, but uh, other than that, you know, it was all letters. and. So yeah, let's actually talk about the games themselves, right? Like you're an Olympic athlete. You did one of the most incredible things that's ever existed, that's ever happened in sports. I mean, what was, aside from understanding, you know, what it was like, I mean, how many people at, you know, from other countries or especially European countries that really understood the situation that was going on? I'm sure Western countries knew as well, but, but what was that like when people would come up to you and be like, you're doing this incredible thing. You're from a country that exists now, but didn't exist recently and all the war torn and this, that, and the other thing, understanding your story and your teammates stories. What was the experience like outside of the actual competition um, with that and being with all these other athletes from around the world? Well, I mean, most, most countries, I mean, I, you know, we all mingled in the same cafeteria, which was size of a, you know, like a indoor stadium that, I mean, it was huge. It was an Olympic village all, you know, in the Olympics, athletes go to Olympic Village and live there. We had our own house. We actually shared a house with Jamaica bobsled team, which was really cool. It was a big house and our team was sharing, sharing with them. So I got to meet those guys and they were popular because there was a movie about them. Um, but then I met everyone else, you know, and most, I mean, we, we uh, first of all, Americans were just like, so, you know, welcoming and so supportive and interested in what was going on, American team especially. Um, Germans, obviously, Germans helped us, I mean, immensely. We wouldn't have done this without Germans. Um, and so most other countries, uh, we didn't get so much love from Russians because they were at the time supporting um, Serbia because they were traditionally connected with them and uh, they were even supporting it during the war and all that. They were sending their own troops, their own specialists into the war zone. So they weren't really happy that we were representing Bosnia, right? Because their politics, were, you know, was was not aligned with the uh, the rest of the world who actually accepted us as a, as a as an independent country. I think they abstained. They they were the only one who vetoed, or like they they voted against accepting us. Um, them and I think that was the only yeah maybe China, but I think Russia for sure. Um, but it was overwhelming. Uh, you come to this Olympic village where you have athletes from all over the world. Uh, I remember. <laughs> going into this huge caf it's cafeteria. It's like a, if imagine if you go to one place, it's like, um, you know, indoor, you know, football stadium where around surrounding you are every fast food chain restaurant that you've ever heard of, right? All around. And you can order McDonald's, you can order pizza, you can order, you know, sushi, you can order pasta from all famous restaurants, you know, including McDonald's, obviously, will be there, and Sparrow Pizza, or, you know, any any chain that you've ever heard of was there, right? I mean, they had McDonald's, and then they had Burger King, just because they needed to have both, right? And uh, and they had Pepsi, and then they had Coke, right, for drinks, and then they had, I mean, for desserts, they had, like, you, you know, Belgian chocolate, uh, and then they had Swiss chocolate, and then you know, like you couldn't, like it's almost like a La La Land if you go in there, and, and you, um, it's like a food festival. So every all the athletes went there twenty four seven. It was open twenty four seven. You can go anytime you want, eat as much as you want, uh, whatever you want, and everyone was there. So interesting thing that happened at the beginning when we all came to the Olympic Village. Every table had flags on them, and every table had designated flags where athletes of that nation would congregate and eat, right? Was it a really interesting thing would happen, right, maybe within the second week of competition. So once competition started, within the second week, you know, one day I walk into the in cafeteria. We call this cafeteria. It was really much more than that. All the tables had all the flags mixed up. So there was no designated table for one flag. There was like multiple flags on every table. So every country's flag was on multiple tables. And so they were all mixed together. So athletes just took the flags and say, screw this. I'm not going to just like 
you know, sit in the corner with my own team. I'm just going to, I want to, I want to sit with these guys and these guys. So they, everyone started to mingle and share table and share food. So you, you hear, you see, you know, and everyone actually, every country had their own outfits. So you can tell by the outfit, what country you were in and we were supposed to wear. There was, there was a, yeah. there was a rule because you have to, you, you know, they give you this outfit and, so you can tell what the, you know who is from what country by wearing an outfit, right? And you can see all these different outfits at the same table, it's just talking to each other, right? Typically in English, there were other languages that were kind of considered universal. Uh, some people spoke German, a lot of German speaking um, in different countries, but um, mostly English, right? Mostly speaking English and conversations were just like you know between all the athletes. They all mingle. So as competition progressed, you know, you, you do your run and once you're done, you're staying in the village no matter what, right? You don't have to go home because you're waiting until the end of the Olympics for the closing ceremony. So once you're done with your sport, you're there and you're relaxed and you just kind of like mingle with people. You go to all these receptions, you meet whoever, right? And, um, and there were a lot of events that were thrown for, for athletes. Uh, so it's fun, right? Once your competition is over, you're like all tense, right? Before the competition, once competition is over, then you're all chilling and relaxing and mingling with people. So that was an amazing experience. We had indoor golf, uh, mini miniature golf. We had swimming pools. We had arcade games room. We had um, just like in indoor clubs. Like uh, they, they built a whole a little town just for athletes, so that you don't have to go really outside at all. I met some great people. I met Olaf Koss, which was the Norwegian uh, Olympic medalist. He won, I think, three Olympic gold in that um, competition. Speed skater. I met a king of uh, Norway uh, and, and queen of Norway. I had a reception with them. I met Prince Andrew. Actually, I trained with Prince, uh, not Andrew, um, Prince Albert from Monaco. Prince Albert from Monaco, actually, I even met him. Back in Germany, when we were training with German team, he came over because that was like elite elite uh, center where we were at. So he came over, Prince Prince of Monaco. I also saw him at the Olympics again. Um, but the most important thing for me personally um, is the radio interviews I gave at the time, because once my competition was finalized, I can talk about it a little bit more later, but. What's important is like once the competition was finalized, I started being invited to give interviews because the story of Bosnia started to really circle around and people were started to be really interested in that there's this theme. So as you said, you know, people started to be aware of what was going on and knowing that there was a Bosnian team, everyone was curious about who these people were, what was really going on, and they, they were all asking questions. So I got into a lot of interviews. Um, and one of them was, for example, with Christy Yamaguchi, you know, Olympic skater. Um, and she was, she was interviewing me. And then the, some other people, right? But the most important interview that I did there that actually is responsible for me being, coming to the United States and being here. So this is, this is really the other twist in the story, right? One is leaving the war, coming even to get to the Olympics. But this is another twist because after war... I was not clear after the Olympics. I was not clear what you know my direction is going to be. Whether I'm going to go back to Bosnia, stay in Europe. I, I had two options, right? I could have done that, but I really wanted to come to the United States, right? And as a kid, I always wanted to, but there was no clear path at the time, right? However, once I get to interview with somebody there, and I'll tell you in a second, I was able to, you know, set myself on a path of coming here, and that that's another story that I think is really crucial to 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 hear so through these different interviews right i started to interview like i said christy yamaguchi and much of other people radio stations in the u.s really gobble up the story about bosnia and every time i gave a story they had more people calling in and more demand of like we want to hear more bring this guy back and so i meet through so just basically because everyone's in the same village right Somebody introduced me to Mark Goodman. Mark Goodman is a former VJ, uh, MTV VJ, who actually was working for, at the time, Chicago radio stations, like 106.7, I think. Um, and that station, he was basically a DJ there now. And 
he was fascinated by Bosnia, by story of Bosnia, and he heard of me in the village. So I already had a little buzz mm -hmm. going around, right, that I was giving the interviews. So he wanted to interview me. He, met, he introduced uh, himself to me. We were somewhere, um, I don't even remember where we actually met, but somebody brought me to him, right? Somebody who knew me, who knew that I, had, I have an interesting story and that he was looking to, for two and three all these athletes. Uh, and he said, I needed to, you know, he told me first time we met, like, I heard of your story. I had to meet you. I had to, would you do an interview for a radio station? I work for a radio station. Would you please do the interview? So he had an improvised small studio there at the Olympic Village. And he sat me down. He interviewed me. He basically asked me to tell the story that I'm telling you, right? Obviously, all this, all that that was, um, uh, well, the entire story from how I started luge, how I got into the sport, to like how I get to be in the Olympics and about war torn Sarajevo and all that, and people just started calling in from the U.S. So this is a radio station that was broadcasted in the U.S. Right, mainly Chicago area. So people started calling in, offering support, help, money. We'll help the, his parents. We'll bring him here, and of all those calls somebody who really changed my life obviously i'm here because of that person is somebody who worked for a that that at the time senator of illinois and this person on her staff called mark goodman so this was a, after our interview aired um several days after and as a matter of fact i did two interviews with mark goodman because it was so first one was so popular the people kept asking like what are you going to bring him back and then i had um <laughs> his friend Danny Banaducci, uh, also who was a guy who in the TV show I never watched, but it was popular popular TV show. He was also a DJ at the time, and his radio station got old. And I met them later. I actually first time I came to this country was in Chicago. I stayed with Mark Goodman. I stayed in his um, um, condo in uh, downtown Chicago. I lived with him for a few weeks. I met Danny Banaducci. I made I did like several other interviews while I was in Chicago. So. But in Lillehammer, when I met these guys, they were fascinated and they just kept telling me how people are so like willing to help, they're offering whatever, right? And uh, this Kathy Tisdall is a person who called him and said, hey, I think we can you know, get this guy a visa to come, to, to come here, right? And uh, I think we can help him. I think we can get through the red tape and you know, given his circumstances and all that, I think we can help him come here and maybe even, you know, live here and claim asylum because, you know, my, my country was in war and I, I was risking death, right? Going back to war-torn country, I would, I would risk retaliation and whatnot. And um, so that was a really interesting thing that happened. I got into a position where, you know, I came back. So this is during the Olympics. Olympics were over. My goodness, I will keep in touch. I went to Germany and stay there for a few months. And I was in constant contact with uh, Mark Goodman, talked to him on the phone every, every week. And he kept appraising me saying, you know, I'm talking to this office, they're, to they're working on this, they're really serious, they wanna. So basically, the long story short, they set me up for a visa. I had to go to Stuttgart, get the visa, get it all, get it to US embassy. They will give me a visa and they will fly me out. They'll pay me a ticket to fly out to Chicago and they'll, they all reset me up there to stay first with Mark Goodman and then with uh, this person's family who called Mark Goodman, right? So they, they signed that they would host me, that they guarantee for me. So, you know, within a few months after Olympics, I was <coughs> on the flight to Chicago, you know. That's, that's amazing. I mean, the power of uh, the power of a good story, right? I'm not good. I guess good is a relative term, but the power of a story is incredible. And, and the opportunities that came from, you know, the, the, what you have been through. And I mean, obviously that was going to be one of my next few topics I want to talk about is understanding how you eventually got here. And you did a great job at explaining that. And, you know, we're, we're very thankful to all the people, you know, thankful that you got on that radio station both times and thankful that, um, you know, a high enough powered person, uh, listened and, and wanted to take action. So, you know, I, I, I believe people are inherently good and that is a clear sign that that is uh, a good person. So we're sincerely, sincerely appreciative of them. I mean, again, going back to your bio that I read earlier, you graduated from Illinois Institute of Technology and it makes sense how you got there now um, because, you know, there's so many other places in the United mm -hmm. States. How'd you make it to Illinois? And it makes sense how you got there now. I think that's just absolutely incredible. Um, 
Yeah, and I have a little story there because yeah, again, yeah. there's there's uh, there's you know human kindness has no boundaries. So also the way I got into the school, you know, when I got to the to the country, I I, I flew into Chicago. I I stayed with Mark Goodman for a few weeks. Uh, but, you know, he has kids and, and wife and all. They were on vacation. So him and I were bachelors for like a few weeks and having fun of my life. And Mark taking me to clubs and meeting his friends, famous friends all over Chicago. And, you know, he's a famous guy. So I didn't even know. But, you know, he was, he was fun to be, to be with and hang out with. So we hang out. We had a good time. But then, you know, I needed, a, needed to go back to school. And, um, you know, I talked to somebody. So person that I mentioned, Kathy, right? She lived in um, with her family in Evanston, uh, which is north of Chicago. And they um, invited me there. And uh, I was, you know, to live with them to like, you know, and uh, before we even before that move even happened, I was given offers from other people. Somebody was offering me a condo on Lakeshore to stay definitely, right? So my goodman was making jokes with me like, hey, Ned, uh, why don't I just give you my and house and I just moved there because that condo to you somebody like he knew the location he knew mm -hmm. the condo it's like I, I want to live there like I'll give you my apartment which was beautiful gorgeous apartment you know with the skyline of Chicago it's like I'll move there and I'll you you can have this one okay buddy uh so I eventually obviously I didn't stay there I, I moved to um with Kathy's family and they I mean that's a whole other story that family is amazing uh, and there's some articles online actually about that. Um, and you can Google it, even find out, you know, staying with them was amazing, life-changing experience. Um, but I met a professor from IIT, Illinois of Institute of Technology, basically through a party. Like they, it, it was their neighbor who was at the party. And I was always good with math. And back in my hometown, home country, obviously, uh, you know, I was in the top school. Um, and that always came kind of natural to me. So I was talking to the professor there who was teaching uh, math and teaching uh, computer science at uh, IIT and um, it, at the party and uh, Professor Green. And I remember talking to him and he, and he was like, oh my God, I'm teaching this kinematics course, a graduate level course. Again, I was an undergraduate, right? I just, so he's like, I'm teaching this graduate level course and, uh, prob and he's just like, you know, one of those guys that just like, you know, nerd guys, and he just talks about problem like everyone understands, and no one understands what he's talking about, right? I'm the only person who actually understood him, so everyone's staring, and and then I got a comment later, like, "You think you're the only person who understands what he's saying?" I'm like, oh, "I know exactly what he's saying," because I remember right like, learning about that. So he and I'm like, "So what was the actual problem? Nobody could get." So he gives me the, this problem, and we were at the sliding door. It was a little foggy, right? And he's starting to draw on the on a, uh, with his finger, right? And he's explaining me the problem, putting you know, like putting the drawing on, and it's a kinematics problem. And I said, "Oh, okay. So if you do this, this, or that, so literally within five minutes, I break down the problem and I show him how I would solve it." And he's like, "Whole, like, whoa! I'm gonna get you into IIT on scholarship." <laughs> So literally next day, the guy goes back and says, like, you have to have this guy. Like, you must have this guy in school. Um, so I got full financial aid, full, like, scholarship to, to go there. I also took tests and all that. But they, you know, just to confirm my level of knowledge, and they said, like, you totally, like, you know, we'll give you full scholarship and on, on academic merit alone. On merit alone. Um, I started, when I war started, I started school, college in Bosnia, but when war broke out. So I was able to just, I really, you know, wasn't able to graduate there obviously because war started, but I was able to start, get some, get, get a little bit of traction. But, uh, you know, I, once I get to IIT, I was able to accelerate that. And so within two and a half years, I get a bachelor's degree, a graduate, um, from IIT. I took a lot of courses. I took summer courses and accelerated it. Um, and, uh, you know, plus they were, you know, giving me such a nice, generous package that, you know, it was great for them that I graduated so early. And then right while I was there, I applied to, you know, a bunch of graduate schools because I wanted to continue education. And I got accepted 
pretty much any school. I, I mean, I only probably applied for six schools, got accepted to all of them. And only MIT, I remember, like they all gave me partial scholarship and some of them expected, you know, some payments, uh, but MIT gave me complete, like full scholarship. And they tell, and also on top of that, which is even more important, they said, you can pick your own area of study. I will let you talk to all the professors and just like pick whatever you like the most. So that was the most generous, right? I was like between Stanford and MIT, I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to go to West Coast, you know, West Coast at this point. I, I think MIT is much more engineering. Like, you know, they're the number one engineering mm-hmm. uh, college in the world. So being an engineer, I, you know, Stanford is great, but Caltech was there also on the list, uh, Berkeley, uh, what else? I mean, so, but, you know, that was MIT's number one. And everyone was like, oh my God, you know, this is like just take like just go yeah so i ended up at mit yeah 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 i think it was it was if you put a dartboard up with each of those colleges and just kind of closed your eyes and threw a dart at the board um any of those colleges you ended up at i think you would have been just fine but mit is i mean it has that stigma it has that that cachet the clout to it which i think is just absolutely incredible so congratulations obviously well deserved um you know with what you did to get into college and then through college and then after at your master's program. I think that that's absolutely incredible. Um, so Ned, I know that there's probably so much more to the story between MIT and now, but I definitely do want to talk a little bit about your current business um, and what you do a little bit. Obviously I hope a lot of people hear this story, what you've gone through and, and what you've been able to accomplish um, in your lifetime. So definitely, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, Cape Ann development, what you do. I know you split time between Boston and New York. You have a couple teams. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you do and, and how you can help uh, companies and, and they can take advantage of uh, your, your intelligence and your, your wherewithal and your discipline and your ability to escape uh, war-torn countries. Let's take, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um. Thank you for mentioning my, my current company, current business. Um, so after graduating from college, um, I worked for, for a few companies um, in the software industry. Um, while I was at college, I was, you know, I started as a mechanical engineering, but I really gravitated toward computer science. I, I, I discovered I had a knack for, uh, for coding, uh, for software, and uh, while I remember at MIT, I got really got a coding bug, and I would stay, you know, every night, and I would code. Uh, we had a, a friend, uh, I mean, uh, uh, another graduate student who became my really good friend. And him and I would stay uh, every night after school in in the lab. We, as a graduate student, you work in the lab. You, it's like kind of like your job. You have to develop, certain, you have to deliver projects for a professor. Your professor is your boss. Uh, and he gives you whatever you need, but it's kind of like work, right? You have your school and then you have your work kind of like that's kind of MIT's way. So I was working for my professor, right? Coding, developing new uh, original codes for telerobotics. Um, it was a, I wanted to focus on this is something new, which at the time was really was starting to grow as a field of tele- telerobotics. And uh, as my thesis work, so I got into software programming. I, st- I took some classes at IIT um, and then some at MIT, but my real education was when I was actually doing it. And it was, I really got into it. I started being really good. I developed something that was incredibly new um, and, and creative. Um, and because of that, you know, we, as a result of that, we actually started a center at MIT called Auto ID Center. I developed a system to control telerobot- robots at distance using virtual reality system that I developed um, myself because it didn't exist. And then out of that, got uh, into this discovery that I made thesis out of, discovery using RFID tags to tag objects in the space and, and I use internet to connect to the phys- physical space and the internet space. And that created Auto ID Center. So that was that was a completely new um, uh, area of study for MIT. MIT started getting publicizing that as a new area of study, and a lot of companies started pour money into the center. That was that was founded by myself, my advisor, and another professor. Started pouring money to sponsor the center. Uh, that center over a decade and something more than a decade created uh, EPC worldwide standard that was that's now used for tracking 
um, RFID uh, objects. Um, as, as a part of my thesis, I developed the idea of concept of the uh, universal modeling language, object-oriented you know, language, uh, coding the information on the RFID tag so it's most efficient, et cetera. So anyway, and uh, the whole system of in connectivity between the physical and the internet world. Um, out of that, so I learned a lot about programming and software by just doing that. So I started software industry, worked for a few big companies over time, started my own companies after that, and before this one, current company. And my current company is called Cape Ann Development um, or Cape Ann Tech. So Cape Ann Development, C-A-P-A-A-N-N Development, uh, started in Boston um, six plus years ago. Um, we grew kind of organically. I just exited one company and was looking for things to do. Started this company. A um, friend of mine kind of had a very successful business where he hired a bunch of people in Eastern Europe from my country of Bosnia, actually. And he was, he started a company in, in uh, Washington, D.C., hired a bunch of people in Bosnia. They were incredible, incredibly talented. Um, people and they were able to build a really successful business. So he was saying, well, maybe you should start by talking to some people there, creating your own team, because I was kind of in between like looking to start another company um, or maybe do this. So I kind of talked to people in Bosnia and never up to that point, even though I'm Bosnian and I haven't really had business ties to Bosnia since I left. Uh, so this was the first time I actually had some business ties uh, and I talked to some teams there, development teams, and, and realize how incredibly talented they are. Because I've, I've worked with the most talented people, not only in the U.S. I mean, I you know at MIT you probably have you know as talented as talented people as you're gonna get anywhere, right? In terms of uh, technology, right? So not only that, but I also worked with worldwide teams. I worked with I worked with teams from different countries. So I had experience of world, working on software projects of various magnitudes, right? Um, very deep projects, also very large for large enterprise companies, working with lots of teams from different parts of the world. So I had a sense for like what it takes to build a very complex system for a very large company, for example, um, before. So I, when I saw people in Bosnia, when I realized what talent in, that they have, I realized I can actually try to try and build a business out of it. So I, I took a small step of like, you know, forming a small team and then finding a first client. And our first client would, you know, was a very difficult, challenging client who came through a recommendation based through my network who recommended that we uh, work with him and um, his company. I brought four people on board, started a project. We heard that this company uh, fired three companies before us, service companies before us, because they were not cutting it for them. So they were very challenge demanding, very demanding their expectations. And uh, so it, I, it made me a little nervous because I've never done service type of business, you know, before. But with this team, with my knowledge and understanding what needs to be done and how it should be delivered, um, I, I was confident enough to give the shot. And second month into the contract, uh, so we said we're going to do a small contract, you know, just a trial, right? It's like that three-month contract. So second into second month, right, or contract, CEO calls me into the office and not, doesn't tell me why, why. And I just like, Oh my God, you know, you may get fired now because you know, three other teams, uh, and, and some of them are, I knew actually pretty good companies got fired. Um, I'm like, ah, oh, he's just going to fire us. So he sets me down and says, you know what? I never worked with a better team in my life. I've been in this business for 20 years. I worked with so many companies. You guys are hands down the best, best team I've ever worked with. I want to retain you. On the spot, he says, like, I want to sign one-year contract guaranteed. I want this team, you know, full-time, blah, blah, blah. So that was, like, my first foray into this business. And I realized, you know, we really have something very valuable. Um, you know, the way I picked the team and the way I picked team now was not only in their technical ability, but also the ability to actually think through a problem and talk to the client. Because I realized if you want to build a business that's scalable, a business that has some that, that is a little bit different than every other you know outsourced company you you want to be able to you know pick those kinds of developers that will not be your typical you know developer who will sit in the back you know and and not talk to the client i wanted people that were able to communicate were able to present solve problems or also present solutions to the client 
And that did several things. One, deepened relationship with client because the clients, you know, like to work with developers. But if developers don't have the ability to work with them, then, you know, you need project managers, product managers as liaisons, right? And some, you know, in, in between people. So that creates a hierarchy and that also creates a line of, uh, it's a broken line of communication because you go through a certain people instead of going th directly to the developers. So I realized if I can remove that middle layer and find a way to develop for developers to communicate directly to clients that would not only flatten the structure and enable me to scale very quickly, but also create much deeper and more meaningful relationships with clients. So that, you know, if clients has issues, they know that their teams, you know, they, they know people are on the team. They don't have to go to a project manager and talk to them in order to get information. They can just go to their own team, right? The team that's assigned to their project. So that feels much more natural. Um, also trust develops because they know, oh, it's a real team, you know, because some companies when you work, you know, and, and this is my experience in the past, I worked with companies where I would talk to project manager, I have no idea who is working on my code, and they might be changing, and they are, they're changing, you know, every week, or every month, somebody else is working on my code, I don't even know people, right, I never even get access to it, all I get is project manager telling me the status, I give requirements, I get status, I you know, and that was it. That was the community level of communication and the relationship we had. One project manager, it could be 20 people behind them or her, and I would never know, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know if they were all the same people or they were just like changing every month. So that was a very difficult thing to manage. Really. And, and you can see the cold le uh, quality, quality of delivery was really weak in those instances, right? So I didn't want to do that ever to any of my clients. I always wanted my clients to know exactly who's on their team. I wanted my developers to be able to communicate. That's how I picked them. So if they're mm -hmm. great developers, smart and all that, that's great. That's a starting point. That's not the end game. To me, you have to be able to re understand the problem at least some level as a business consultant to understand why they want to do this. So you can also be able to tell them maybe there's a better way to do it. So you have to be business person first and developer second. That was really... Mm -hmm challenging for some people to like understand but i i realize bosnian people have a knack for talking to they have a very natural way of communicating and relating to clients and then i picked those because there was cultural already a cultural thing already um all i needed to do is find those people that are really you know great developers they already had the cultural ability to connect but they also find those that were able to to be more business-like right mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. able to solve business problems and understand business context of what they're trying to do. That's what, how I handpicked them in the beginning. And it took me a few years to really handpick the best ones, right? But once you get that kernel, once you get that team, original teams started, they attract other people like mm -hmm. them. Yep. So my job was almost, you know, once I picked their you know, core team, the core team kind of like started bringing, you know, candidates to me. It's almost like, they were attracting the same type of talent, right? Very, very high level talent that, you know, so, so, so that was a really, uh, that's how we really built a team and um, it was really successful. Yeah, congratulations. Um, it took few years, you took, yeah, it took a few years to do it, but I mean, that's like in every team, you, you kind of like trying to figure out what makes you different, what makes you um, unique and, that's one of the things that really makes us unique, you know, that kind of relationship um, mm -hmm. that we have towards client and that the kind of profile of talent that we have. And it's, and it's nice for you because you get to work with people from your home country. Um, and, you know, obviously that's where this conversation yes. started. Um, and it seems like that's kind of where this conversation is going to end. So I think it's incredible. So thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your business. Obviously, thank you so much for sharing about your life and your, your just adventure, let's call it. Um, incredible, absolute amazing adventure that you're able to get out of uh, a situation and turn it around completely. And, and, you know, I, could not have imagined what your life would look like if you didn't decide to try and get out of uh, the country. You know, what if you were too scared and you stayed there? Um, you know, so I just think there's so many different opportunities and thankfully you said yes to all the situations you had to and, and you got us here. So uh, one more time, we have Ned Lomagora. I think I said that correctly, of the Bosnian Luge team, the 1994 Olympian um, business owner, incredible storyteller. Uh, Ned, sincerely, thank you so much. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you, Michael. I really enjoy this.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Our Athletes. I know this wasn't a Team USA athlete. It's on the World Athlete Series, but Ned's story is incredible. He's an Olympian. He lives here now. I'm becoming very good friends with him, actually. We, we meet up every once in a while. Um, and just very excited to get that out there. So I think the story is incredible and I uh, really hope that you all thoroughly enjoyed it. So everything about his business, about him, will be in the show notes, as well as us. Please follow us at ourathletes.us on Instagram, at ourathletesusa on Twitter, Michael at ourathletes.us for the email, and check out the website, ourathletes.us, just to get some more information on what we're doing with these sponsorships, endorsements, and experiences for Olympic athletes, which we're really excited about. Um, Other than that, really, really happy that you enjoyed this episode, and please make it a wonderful day.